Okay, so day one of the playoffs, already crazy. Day two of the playoffs, I'm going to go with already unpredictable. Unfortunately, not all of that for good things because we've already got some injuries. We got Tyler Hero with a broken hand. Ja has a hand injury that he says is very painful. The last thing I saw about it, Giannis had a lower back contusion. It seemed like AD was going to have a shoulder or arm issue, but he ended up being okay, so that's good. If you thought the Suns were just going to steamroll the Clippers without PG, well, that game one happened. And then we had Nuggets-Wolves, which was a basketball game. All right, let's start with Lakers-Grizzlies. Yes, let's appreciate the irony now. I switched off the Lakers. They had a very convincing game one win. Within that, me being like, well, I like the Lakers outside of LeBron and AD. I don't know if they can beat the Grizzlies game after game with how good the Grizzlies' defense is. I should have also added, like, I felt the best about Reeves, but I definitely did not expect Rui to be dropping 29 with five threes in game one. A couple of his threes were a bit of a theme in this one where the Lakers would run a side pick and roll, whether it be like D'Lo and AD, LeBron even screened for Schroeder, I think, on one of these, and then they would just have Rui basically on the other wing, and then it would put like Santi Aldama or Jaron Jackson, or I want to say Dylan Brooks was even one of them too, where they're just helping at the free throw line basically, and they're pretty much daring Rui to be like, hey, can you make a three over a tough closeout? And the answer in that game was definitely yes. Now, within this, Rui also was cooking a little bit as he made that one turnaround baseline jumper over Desmond Bain, which, okay, that one was wild. There was also an up-top pick-and-roll where it was D'Lo and AD, and D'Lo made a great pass from basically, like, right below the free-throw line to the left corner where Aldama was playing off of Rui at the corner again. So the Lakers were definitely able to take advantage of the Grizzlies being a little aggressive with their help defense. In fact, that was what led to that one where Austin Reeves made the behind-the-back pass to Rui because they were doubling AD pretty hard, and then AD made a great pass to the opposite corner where Reeves was pretty much wide open for a second before Dylan Brooks closed out. Reeves gets by him around the back pass to Rui. Bang, that's a three. The other one was when LeBron got a double team from Jaron like the second he caught the ball. And so again, you know, you're daring Rui to make the three, and he made him. As far as Austin Reeves, so, I mean, Reeves was doing in this game a lot of what he was doing you know, when he started just descending, right? It was just a lot of pick and roll ball handling where the Grizzlies were, for the most part, at least on the ones he scored on, they were dropping on him, right? Like Jaron was dropping on that pull up three that was huge in the fourth quarter. The floater that he had right after where he got, I actually don't remember who the defender was, but he got somebody on his back and he was able to make that. Like the Grizzlies were just dropping on Reeves' screens. They were daring him to beat him and he beat him. They also did double Rui in the post once, which was a little wild that Rui eventually demanded that much attention, at least on one play, and then he made a great pass to Reeves for a three. Within all this, you had, like, you know, your typical AD in the post stuff. You had LeBron screening for guards. So, like, it was a pretty balanced offensive thing from the Lakers, and LeBron only had to play, like, 33 minutes, I believe. 34. Um, as for the Grizzlies, so Jaron Jackson in the post was definitely, like, the most promising thing on offense for him, just his, the hooks, the spins, the uh, footwork, patience. You know, that was a big thing he grew on this year was not freaking out when the defender has good position, but sort of like taking a second being like, all right, what do I do next? Whether it's spin over one of my shoulders or whatever. Should mention that Vanderbilt did start the game on Ja, so that question was answered. I think LeBron started the game on Jaron. And the Grizzlies offense, I mean, it really fell apart like in the last two and a half minutes where it was like Desmond Bain ran a little action with Tyus Jones, ends up taking a step back three over Reeves, like wasn't great. You had Jaron who uh, LeBron switched onto him and then... He takes him into the post. AD doubles super aggressively. They get the turnover out of Jaren. and they're going the other way. I know AD had a million blocks with some of those being like the Grizzlies kind of driving just right at him in a weird way. Uh, but this was not the super slog of a grind to find buckets that I think at least I thought it was going to be. Now, it, it could be that moving forward. These are still two great defenses, but yeah, we'll see. And also Jaren, not in foul trouble, played 37 minutes. And so after game one, the biggest questions I have with the series are, will Rui and Reeves' performances change the Grizzlies' defense at all? Are they going to keep dropping on Reeves? Are they going to keep daring the Lakers' shooters to be there? I mean, you have to provide help. You can't just stay glued to everybody, of course. So, And also, of course, how is Jaws' hand doing? Now we get on to Clippers' Suns. I should have done a series preview for this one, but I did not. My pick would have been the Suns. Shocking, I know. But let's just get to Kawhi, man. So he was cooking for mid-range a bit, with my favorite one being a deep two-pointer in the fourth quarter over KD, where it was just jab step right into the mid-range. I loved it. Uh, but they were also running some, like, Zubats off-ball actions for Kawhi just to get him positioning, like, in the post before going to whatever. It felt like Torrey Craig was on him most of the time. I do remember another time where he got KD on some pump fake, and then he got a trip to the line off of that. Late there, they 
basically triple teamed him in the paint, which led to Eric Gordon making a top of the key three. And then we had maybe the most Russell Westbrook game that you could possibly imagine. So he goes three for 19, missed a whole bunch of stuff in the paint, fadeaways and layups, the whole thing. And then he pulled off a bunch of wild defensive stuff with that one on Booker late where he, what, blocks him and then throws it off of him. He also blocked an eight and free throw line jumper from behind in that fourth. Bunch of offensive boards, including that one where he, like, skies over Torrey Craig and then kicks it to Kawhi for one of the bigger threes, you know? Again, it was the most Russell Westbrook game you could possibly imagine. The other thing for this Clippers team, for me, always is, are they getting enough downhill stuff going? Well, listen, I remember Eric Gordon beating DeAndre Ayton in a one-on-one. I remember a Gordon sort of fake down screen where he was, like, acting like he was going to use the Zubat screen to go up to the top of the key, but then he goes the other way and, like, kind of freezes KD, gets a layup off a good pass from Russ. A couple plays where they attacked really early in the half court, which I think allowed them to get, like, a dump off to Zubats. And also, the Clippers had 29 free throws, and yeah, some of that's going to be Kawhi and just his general existence, but, you know, there were a couple plays where, like, Norm Powell is taking a play that is otherwise kind of dead, and I think he's driving into Biombo, which one of them could have gone 50-50, but they ended up calling a blocking foul. Similar stuff with Terrence Mann, you know, those little plays that just add up. I mean, hell, one of Kawhi's corner threes, I think, like, late third, was Norm Powell just attacking off the catch and then making the next play. Anyway, on to the Suns side of this one. You know, it was a weird game from the Suns' offense. Number one, they took 27 mid-rangers, which is fighting the math very, very hard. And I understand they have three of the best mid-range shooters ever, but still, 27, that's a lot of mid-range shots. And yes, I was just saying that Kawhi was cooking for mid-range, and one of my favorite shots from him was a deep two-pointer. The difference is the Clippers took 14 mid-rangers, so still way less than the Suns. And uh, look, a lot of them were pull-ups around a DeAndre Ayton screen. Or it was Aiden taking a mid-ranger because the big dropped and then they threw it back to him, you know? It did also feel like there were stretches where, like, KD or Booker were making the right play, but weren't necessarily just being featured in the offense enough. Like, I say this as Booker was the ISO guy at the last play there when Russ blocked him and all that. And there were, like, three plays late in that fourth quarter that I just looked at that kind of summed up what I'm talking about. So two of them were just a CP pull-up mid-range off of a DeAndre Aiden screen while... KD and Book are just spotting up, and I mean, he missed both of them. If he makes both of them, I guess I'm not talking about him. The other one was when Russ actually had that block on Aiton from behind where KD screened for CP. So, okay, we like that. Clippers switch. It's now Terrence Mann on KD, and then it goes to the corner, and it ends up becoming the Aiton free throw line jumper that Westbrook blocks from behind. And again, if the shot goes in, then maybe we're not talking about this, but it's just like if the Clippers are able to turn what could be a Kevin Durant going at Terrence Mann play into a Let's improvise and, oh, now we have Aiton at the free throw line. Like, you're going to take that if you're the Clippers. Now, we did get a big Torrey Craig game. Some of them off of made threes. Some of them with him, like, screening for KD and then hitting, like, a floater or whatever. Like, that's cool. I don't know if we're going to bank on Torrey Craig dropping 20 points in the playoffs, but still, shout out to Torrey Craig. It just didn't feel like enough Kevin Durant while he still had 27 and 11. I think trying to get some cutters at the rim at, like, at the same time that there's a screen action up top could also do a lot for him. Then we get on to the Heat and the Bucks. So Giannis went down, and the update we got was they had an x-ray last night. It came back clear, and Budenholzer said, we'll monitor him and see how he wakes up tomorrow. Okay. As for the Heat, well, I want to start with Bam, who made all of the paint jumpers that Brooke Lopez always dares him to make. More so in the second half. I remember when the game opened up and Brooke was way back on Bam, it was like, oh God, if Bam does not take advantage of this, I don't know if the Heat are going to have a shot. But in the second half, I think it was, it felt like six or seven times where he was just taking basically a free throw line jumper or whatever. And I mean, the adjustment possibility for the Bucks there is simply just having Brooke a little higher up on Bam. But, you know, we know what the Bucks like to do. They like to wall off the thing and they're willing to give up some mid-range jumpers. You know, we'll see. Bam also had a couple in transition. He also had one where Jimmy took somebody off the dribble. He relocates around the rim for something. But, you know, also speaking of Jimmy with his big game, there were a couple of times where going at Brook in a drop, he didn't just like immediately take like the deep two, but more so like kept the ball on the floor in order to just get like a couple feet closer or relocate to a side of the paint to get like a bank shot or whatever. I loved one play where similar to the Laker game, uh, the Heat ran a like side pick and roll and then Jimmy catches it on the opposite wing and immediately catches or goes off the catch. And there were also some interesting things there with, like, before Hero went down, like, he had a couple of handoff plays where Brooke was not going to go high up on him, so he was able to get a three around, like, a bam screen. Or uh, Kevin Love had, like, one pick and pop where Brooke stayed back and Crowder had to close out to Kevin Love. So, and also the Heat threes went in. I mean, if you were banking on the Heat 
shooting, what, 60% from three, then okay. Middleton was getting buckets. Obviously a great sign if you're the Bucks. And we'll just see where Giannis is at, man. Yes, the Bucks should still win the series. Uh, as for the Nuggets and the Wolves, hey, you know what, Wolves? You try again in game two, all right? <laughs> Shout out to Jamal Murray.